We're going to focus more narrowly in on the issue of the image of God. So I think we'll be around page 9 in the notes. Our first two days of class, we were broad in the sense of the first day, I think we did a a big broad overview of uh, the doctrine of man and Scripture going all the way from Genesis through Genesis 1 through Revelation 22. Last class, we also were broad, but narrowed it a little bit. We kind of did a you know, biblical theology of man in Genesis 1 to 11. Today, we're going to focus more, I guess, systematically on the concept of the image of God. I've already made some statements about the image of God, so it's not like we're just introducing this for the first time. But I think the issue of the image of God is a very important, very strategic doctrine. I also think it's one in which there's, I don't know if confusion is the right word, but perhaps lack of clarity when it comes to people's thinking. You know, if somebody were to, I'm just, I, I understand you guys, as bright as you are, would have a great answer to this. I'm just kind of speaking generically. You know, if somebody were to say to you, hey, you know, I keep reading this concept of the image of God in the Bible. You know, what is the image of God and why is it important? I mean, what, what would you, you know, what would you say if somebody said, you know, I got 10 minutes here, I need you to explain to me the image of God and how this fits into the, the big picture story of the Bible? You know, would you be able to do that? Like, because you guys are so bright, you guys would have a very full, you'd say, can, actually, can I have a half hour to explain it, right? Um, but I think probably, just probably, I'm just going off of a guess, I think probably in the, uh, in the pews and the churches and stuff, if we were to go up to the average person and say, you know, you know, what's your understanding of the image of God and why does it matter? You know, you may get some blank looks because uh, probably I think a lot of people, when they think of the image of God, they, they know that it's important. There's a sense in which, you know, human beings have a uh, place in God's creation that is higher than, you know, the animals and the birds and the fish, etc. And they know that it probably includes some ways in which we're different from the rest of the creation. But, you know, can we go, you know, deeper than that? And that's kind of what we're going to be looking at today. Now, we've already made some statements. We've already made some statements in regard to the issue of being in the image and likeness of God. We've already, you know, we've pointed out that these two the concepts of the, uh, the zealum and the demut, the image and the likeness, are... Uh, they're not exactly the same, but they're very closely related. Uh, sometimes they can appear to almost be used synonymously. When we're talking about, you know, the image of God, we were emphasizing the concept of king, the function of ruling. When we're talking about likeness, we're talking about being a son. So if this is king in regard to ruling, son in regard to relationship, mentioned last time that because man, again, we're talking about Genesis 1 and 2, we're talking about pre-fall man, man was created as a son in relationship with God, and because he is a son in relationship with God, he is tasked with being a king to rule the earth on God's behalf. So, you know, we refer to man as a king, capital K, king belongs to God, small k, king belongs to man, but we saw that in Psalm 8, verses 4 to 8, which is a commentary on Genesis 1, 26 to 28, the original image of God passage with the rule and subdue, that, you know, man has been, you know, crowned with glory and honor. He has, you know, dominion over the creation. So I think the concept of the vice regent, the one who's been tasked and delegated by God to rule the earth for God, on God's behalf, so that takes you back to, obviously, Genesis 1, 26 to 28 and the importance of that passage. You know, to some degree, I think the, the rest of the Bible after Genesis 1, 26 to 28 is the story of uh, man's failure and then eventual success through the ultimate man, Jesus Christ, the last Adam, to fulfill the mandate that was given to him by God. And so remember, that's, in a sense, of you know, biblical history is is the process by which God by which God has tasked men to glorify Him through ruling the creation. We know man fails. We know that Jesus Christ comes 
he succeeds, particularly in the millennial kingdom, we'll both see him and those who identify with him ruling. And then when that mandate is completed successfully, we roll into the eternal state. We also talked about, too, the definition uh, that Grudem talked about, that when you put these concepts together, there's also a sense in which man is like God and represents God. We always have to qualify what we mean by like God. You know, man's not ontologically God. He's not eternal. Uh, there ends up being some certain incommunicable attributes that he will never share, such as aseity, you know, which means having life in and of it yourself. We can only exist because there's a creator and a sustainer. But there are going to be certain things such as personhood and rationality and love and those sorts of things that have comparisons with God who is perfect in those areas, but are also going to be true of those who are uh, human beings. So we've already kind of laid these things out. Now we're going to talk about some other areas in regard to the image of God. And particularly, we'll, we'll, we'll look more at the whole, you know, issues of, uh, you know, the, the image of, is the image of God primarily so, something structurally that a person is created that involves their being, or does it, re, it, or does it uh, solely in regard to function or relationship? Uh, we're going to argue, I think there's going to be a close relationship between man created in the image of God or living man created image of God and what he's supposed to do. So we'll end up arguing that there's a close relationship between structure in regard to who man is and then what man is supposed to do. Now, starting out on page nine of your notes, you know, I, I mentioned the various passages that talk about, uh, you know, image and likeness. Uh, some of these we've already looked at. We've looked, we've already looked at Genesis 1, 26 to 27, where, you know, God says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. We also looked at Genesis 5, 1 to 2, where it's talking about, you know, in the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female. He blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. In Genesis 9, 6, we also see reference to the image of God. Whoever, now this is post-fall, post-flood, whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. So the fact that you have a post-fall reference to man being made in the image of God is significant because that shows that the, the fall did not remove the image of God in man. So it's not destroyed, it's still there. So even in a fallen world, if somebody were to kill another human being, that would be considered a strike at God because that person you know, uh, has uh, the image of God, is made in the image of God. So I, you know, I think it's generally correct to refer to, I mean, there's the, the image of God has been marred, but not destroyed. Uh, one of the things that we saw with the Psalm 8 passage is the creation mandate for man to rule and subdue has never been revoked. And I think that rule and subdue function is closely related to the image of God. So there's going to be a marring of the image, but not a, not a destruction. 1 Corinthians 11, 7 refers to, For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God. James 3, 9, when it's talking about our speech and our tongues, it says, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. Not, not presented as a good thing, but it's presented as what we do with our tongues when we're acting evil, uh, cursing men who would be made in the image of God. So the image of God still is very relevant to today. Uh, I mentioned with Roman numeral two, uh, implications regarding the image of God. None of the above verses gives an explicit a definition. Uh, as Carl Henry has stated, the Bible is not defined for us the precise content of the original imago. Sometimes when you're studying the doctrine of the image of God, you'll see references to the Imago Dei. That ends up being you know, the Latin uh, understand uh, the Latin translation of the, of the image of God. Uh, some things we want to affirm also about the image of God. Creation in the image of God is affirmed for all persons. And I think this is pretty strategic for uh, the Christian worldview is that we're affirming that, you know, based on Genesis 1, 26 to 27, uh, we see that both male and female are created as an uh, image of God. And 
So, I mean, it wouldn't hurt to go there again. If you look at Genesis 1, you know, 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And then in verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So mankind is going to take the form of male and female. We see that they're both image of God, which I think we see a very important truth, which is not always assumed in other religions <laughs> necessarily, is that we're seeing what we consider to be an ontological equality between men and women. So men and women are both image of God. Uh, not One gender is not more important or better than the other gender. Uh, we will see that ontological equality does not always mean functional sameness. I mean, there can be order when it comes to uh, uh, when, when it comes to function and those sorts of things. Uh, you know, I think we see the uh, equality of essence, difference in function. I think we see it in all different kinds of ways. You know, it's obviously true in the you know in the family unit where you know if you were to say you know, who, who's, who's, the, who's more human or who's more important ontologically, uh, parents or a child, we would say, well, they're both image of God, they're both people. It's not like one is more important than another, but we would understand within the family relationship that the parents have an authority role that the child doesn't. So in a family unit, you can have equality in essence, but difference in function. You know, even when we look at the Trinity, you know, we don't say, well, which of the members of the Trinity is more God or better than the other members of the Trinity? I mean, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are all equally God, equally important, yet we understand that there's functional distinctions within the Trinity. The Father sends the Son. When Jesus came, he said he didn't come to do his own will, but the will of the Father. And so even within the Trinity, you can, you, you can uh, have that. Uh, even within the church, I mean, you can have uh, elders and non-elders. You know, the elders aren't more important people than the non-elders, but they have a different function. So all of this sort of thing goes back to creation. Uh, but we do want to affirm here that there's, when it comes to the male-female, they are equally image of God. They will have uh, different different roles within that, but they are both equal. Mentioned on the point B, you know, creation in the image of God involves being like God in some unspecified way. Um, but of course, that does not mean that we're divine or of the same essence of God. Uh, mentioned on point C, creation in the image of God is the basis for human uniqueness and dignity. No other created being is said to be created in the image and likeness of God. Thus, humans have a special place of dignity and responsibility that is not shared by other created beings. So... I think it is, you know, legitimate to point out that, you know, just even the way the, the days of creation are ordered with man being created on the sixth day and then the last thing on the sixth day, you know, indi indicates, a, uh, uh, indicates a priority. Obviously, man's going to have certain characteristics um, that will be not shared uh, with others. I think Wayne Grudem in his chapter, he goes into, you know, various ways in which human beings are different than then animals, complexity of emotion. I think we talked about that before. You know, a, uh, an angry, a dog can be angry at a particular time, but usually animals don't have complexity of emotion like a human being may have. So uh, there are uh, differences. Of course, one of the interesting questions too comes into the fact, well, we know that there are angels and we know that they have volition and we know, you know I mean, if you, depending on your understanding of Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, which you know, appeared to just, at least I, I think they are describing uh, the original fall of Satan. You know, we know that you know, Satan had volition and chose against God. Um, you know, later Adam will do that as well. You know, for our understanding of angels, we see that there's personhood there and that there's characteristics that they have that seem pretty similar to humans, yet they're not said to be made in the image of God. We're going to get into this later, but I think, I think the concept of the image of God is very closely related to the three relationships that God puts man into, which we're going to get more into this later. But you know, there's a being image of God means man that is put in a relationship with God, put in a relationship with other human beings, and then relationship to the created order. Now, obviously, angels are have a relationship with God or should have a relationship with God. But I think when it comes to those other areas as far as man to man and then man to creation, there ends up being certain things in regard to how God has uh, made and tasked man that there is a difference than, than, than with the angels. If you read uh, Hebrews 2 verses 5 to 8, 
the writer explicitly says, when it comes to this world or the world to come, you know, he did not make it to be ruled over by the angels. He made it to be ruled over by man. And of course, there ends up being a, a physicality aspect of man that is not shared with the angels. So even though there's similarities between person, between human beings and angels, there ends up being some key uh, distinctions as well. Okay, point D, you know, we mentioned earlier that the image of God has not completely been lost. Carl Henry puts it, the moral earthquake of the fall impaired the imago or the image of God. It did not wholly uh, demolish it. I have a quote here from Wayne Grudem in the box. After the fall then, we are still in God's image. We are still like God and we still represent God, but the image of God in us is distorted. We are less fully like God than we were uh, before the entrance of sin. And we certainly don't, in our sinful state, don't manifest what the image of God is supposed to look like. And that'll be why later on when we get to discussing the importance of Christ in regard to the image of God, as we see him as a pers- as a human being, you know, he have the incarnation, so he's God and man. But as he is structurally human, we're able to see how he relates to the three relationships and does that. And that will become a pattern for how uh, we should do things. Okay, creation in the image of God also means point E, that we belong to God. All humans cannot escape the fact that being made in the image of God means that they are all responsible and accountable to God. God is worthy of devotion, love, loyalty, and service. So I think being in the image of God, again, remember an image in the ancient Near East when a pharaoh or a king would put an image somewhere, that that image represented them in that area and stood for their authority. We talked about when we're image of God, we're made as, in a sense, kind of like living statues for God's glory, but I think there's there's an imprint of the Creator on every human being, and so uh, and because of that, you know, we you know, I would tie this into just Romans one, uh, because we're all made in the image of God. I think there is a, there is an innate sense that every person has of the Creator. When you read Romans one, you see that that God uh, both through His being our Creator and also seeing the rest of the creation that we. Uh, we know that God is there, and that cannot uh, be escaped, although uh, people suppress the truth and unrighteousness, but there's still that understanding. For even though they knew God, they didn't give glory to God as they should. Uh, point F, uh, we should pattern our lives. I think this is a very important point, point. After Jesus, who was the complete revelation of the image of God, the perfect example of a human is Jesus. Uh, these passages here, you know, they might even be good to look at. I was going to look at them later, but maybe this is a good point to do it. Let's let's just look at a, a survey of these. Look at Second uh, Corinthians four four. Second Corinthians chapter four verse four. It talks about in verse three that if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So Christ is presented as the image of God explicitly there. If you look at Colossians 1.15, Colossians 1.15 refers, talking about Jesus here, and says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So he is the image of the invisible God. Um, And then also, this shows you how practical it gets for us as as Christians. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Now this this kind of gets into the the purpose or, or... kind of like what this means for us practically. You know, verse 28 says, we know that God causes you know, all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are, called in, who are called according to his purpose. Verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, what did he predestine them for? To become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. So notice all these things God is doing with this golden chain of salvation in Romans 8, is for the purpose to be conformed to the image of his Son. So Jesus is the perfect image of God, and hopefully with sanctification, with the Spirit working in our lives, we're becoming more and more conformed to 
the image of his son. And as we're doing that, we're functioning more like the image of God is supposed to be. Because what's hap- what are the main things that are really happening with sanctification is you're loving God more and better and you're loving other human beings more and better. Um, I really think at the heart of the image of God is relationship and love. And as a person is manifesting that, they're functioning more as the image of God is supposed to function. And of course, since Jesus is the perfect one of that, as we become more and more like him, we're evidencing more and more of what we're supposed to be. Yep. Uh, you said at the beginning that the, um, the image of God brings us to the relationship that we can have with God, mm-hmm. with people, and with nature. Mm-hmm. How that relate, relate with Jesus in terms of Jesus having the right relationship with nature? Yeah, how does that work? Yeah, how does that work? Uh, and if you yeah. have any passages that... Yeah, uh, in other words, the first two are kind of easy to grasp, right? That's where I think a proper understanding of eschatology comes into play. I think I think the I may mean, I, I would say with with all three of those relationships. So remember, we're, we're talk as we talk about man as image bearer. Remember, he's supposed to function in regard to God, humans, creation. I would say. I mean, now this is where you do have the intersect of anthropology with eschatology and the intersect with the new covenant. So when the, when the new covenant comes into play for the believer, so I, I think when a person becomes a believer, they become related to the new covenant. The Holy Spirit begins to dwell in their life. I think when it comes to our relationship with God, I think we see kind of an already, not yet, in the sense that we are in a right relationship with God, but obviously it's not as perfect as it'll be when we're glorified, right? So, we, so we, we do know God now, and even sanctification makes us more and more like that. I think even when it comes in regard to humans, that there's a, an already not yet aspect to that in the sense that we, we are now, we do love the brethren and we love people, and we are certainly doing it better than we were an unbeliever, but it's still not what it'll be when we're glorified, right? I think when it comes to the creation, that, that's mostly a not yet in regard to and I say mostly because I don't want to say that man has no relationship or whatever to the creation today. But I'm saying when it comes to the actual, what that looks like as far as the fulfillment of it, how that looks, that's going to probably be more not yet uh, than the other two. And what's, what's interesting about this is uh, your, your eschatology and your millennial view is going to really direct, is really going to impact your view of the creation. Because if you're, if you're post-millennial, you know, post-millennial believes, particularly if you're a, a, the, a theonomist post-millennialist, you're going to believe that this is this age leads to the millennium before Christ comes again, and therefore the the rule and subdue mandate needs to be carried out before Jesus comes. So if you're post-millennial, there's going to be a heavy already because that's they would actually say that's the church's task is to be part of the transformation of the society and the creation, and then Jesus comes. If you're amillennial. It's a little bit of a mix. They're still seeing more, uh, more involvement with the creation, perhaps, than the premillennialist would. But if you're premillennial, you know you're going to see primarily the church's task in this age as being gospel proclamation, warning people to flee the wrath to come, to understanding the day of the Lord is coming. But once the day of the Lord does come, then obviously the second coming of Christ is going to come after that, and then the millennial kingdom ends up being the time where the creation experiences the fullness of uh, restoration with man's role in, re- in regard to that. When we get into the Hokuma book, we'll actually get more into that, and we'll point out some differences between uh, perhaps Hokuma's amillennial understanding and, and a premillennial understanding. But I would put this primarily in the not yet. But I would say this. I do think sometimes people... Sometimes people have gotten the idea, almost kind of like a Platon, a Platonist understanding that, you know, the yes man was tasked to rule the earth, but ever since the fall, our destiny now is just heaven in a realm far, far away forever. You know, because we do believe that, and I, I would say the right view is that we are headed for a new heavens and a new earth. Man has a relationship to the planet. I do think that there is going to be a, hopefully a, um, understanding of the importance of the creation that perhaps would even impact 
how we look at it today. So I would hope that there's present implications, but the fulfillment mostly future. Does that help? Yep. Okay, go ahead. I understand the uh, image of God is still within men, and yeah. I'm, I'm wondering about the likeness, because it says there's just a difference. It's the king ruling and then the son in a relationship. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I understand the sanctification for Christians. What about the non-believers? Are they rebellious children of God, or are they rebellious children of the devil, as we say? Yeah, and I guess it depends on where you come. I mean, in the sense of God, I mean, in, in the the overwhelming emphasis of Scripture is is, is unbelievers being a, of, of your father, the devil. Um, but the very fact that God is creator of all in that sense, there is that. So I guess it depends on how you, how you look at it in that. Um, because I'm seeing such a close relationship between image and likeness and the fact that we know script, our Scripture has indicated that fallen man hasn't lost the image of God, um, I, t I tend to view these things as still being... Um, in other words, I think you can affirm people are still in the image of likeness of God, but that's not a statement that of, of automatic salvation. I mean, there's a marring of that image. People still need to be get saved to be need to be saved in order to be in a right relationship with God. So, I would still say that that's that's there. Does that help or? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Um. So, but but coming back to this point here about Jesus as the image of God, the this this is one area where I actually think the Hokuma book is very helpful. I think particularly in chapters three and five. Um, I'm speaking very generally here, but if you pick up a lot, um, if you look, if you do a perusal of evangelical systematic theologies, oftentimes the image of God is mostly discussed in ways in which uh, people are different from animals, or you know, different from the rest of the creation, which I think is totally legitimate to discuss. But I think Hokuma does a really good job in his chapters of emphasizing that the main thing that we should be focusing on is since Jesus is perfect image of God, as we pursue what he is like, then we're actually getting a tangible um, example of what the image of God is supposed to look like. Like it's one thing to just contemplate how we're different from animals, but it's, then it's another thing to focus on how Jesus loved God and loved others. And then as we pursue that, we're pursuing what the, uh, what the image of God is. And just to kind of give you my nutshell view, I, since I think that the, the image of God is so cr closely related to these three relationships, and I think the thing that's at the core of the relationships is love. So in other words, when, when I think of image of God, not only do I think of the function, but I also think of the relationships. So I think of... Image of God is very, very relational. And what's at the core of being relational? The, at the core of that is love. You know, what's, and then I think you even see that with the commands in Scripture. You know, Jesus is asked, what's the, what's the greatest command or commandments? And what does he say? Love God and love your neighbor, right? I mean, that's really at the core of the relationship. So I think when it really comes down to it, how do you know if you're functioning properly as the image of God in your life, you ask, how am I loving God and how am I loving other people? That ends up being the way. And of course, when you read, I mean, lots of scripture, but what is, you know, what is first John hammer over and over again? Loving God, loving others. How do you know you love God? You love others. How do you know you love others? You love God, <laughs> all those sorts of things. And so what I like about that is it, it gives me something tangible. How am I loving God? How am I loving my family? How am I loving the people that I'm in contact with? And is, if, I'm, if I'm progressing in that, then I can know that I'm manifesting more and more what the image should, should look like. Yep. So you're saying that's, the, you think you see that as the big thing in um, being image bearers, issue of, of love. Is that, is that because like, I guess, because um, you know some people, they, they look at Scripture, this paradigm, yeah. that the only attribute or the supreme attribute is, is God's love. And I, I don't know what the supreme attribute is. I don't know how you would argue that. Yeah. But I guess God has attributes that, that are communicable and mm -hmm. others that aren't. Yeah. So are you saying it because of that? Like that, that is a, um, I'm a... Well, let's just say I'm doing it all of the above. I'm affirming all of that. I'm, I'm, I'm affirming function... I'm affirming uh, communicable attributes. I'm 
affirming differences from the rest of the creation. All I'm saying is just like there, it appears to be, like I said, if you just like, when Jesus gives the summation of the law, like what's at, what's at the core of it? It's love God and love others. And that, that's not mutually exclusive to the other attributes and communicable attributes, but I'm just saying when you're, when you're, when you're getting down to the nutshell of what it's about, I think the, the, the nutshell of why we're created is for relationship and it's relationship with God, others, and then eventually creation. So I'm kind of singling that out as a, at the, at the, heart, of the uh, at, at the heart of what relationships are about, but, it's a, but it also affirms the other things. Certainly not mutually exclusive. So I guess if I'm, if I'm kind of doing my laundry list of image of God, I'm saying it has implications for kingship, for sonship, for ruling, for relationship. It's ways in which we're different than the creation. It involves communicable attributes. It involves these you know, three relationships of which love is at the primary essence of, of what that's about. Okay. All right, the... And then on point G, the image of God is a starting point or a common ground issue that Christians have with all non-believers. So a little bit of an intersect here with uh, apologetics. Uh, some of you are here are in apologetics class. W one of the big issues when it comes to evangelicals debating apologetic starting points, one of the issues that comes up a lot is, well, what, what's, what's the common ground that we can try to reach the unbeliever with? And I think the fact that everyone's made in the image of God is a key starting point as we're dealing with people and even, even on an apologetic level. What do I mean by that? Try as they may, all unbelievers are made in the image of God. And there is a real sense in which all people know God, Romans 121, because God has revealed himself to all people through his creation. The Christian can be confident that the image of God means that each person he or she speaks to already knows that he or she is accountable to God. The Christian can call on the unbeliever to you know, lay down his autonomy and rebellion, which was at the heart of the very first sin <laughs> with Adam and Eve, and to come to trust and believe in the God that um, deep down inside they know uh, exists. So I think that's helpful to understand when you're dealing with people who have different world views. I mean, obviously there's going to be barriers you have to work through there, but at the heart uh, issue, everybody's made in the image of God. They all have to live in God's world. So I think in a nutshell, we all have more in common than, than different, although there can be some difference, but we're all made in the image of God. That could be a starting point for our encounter. Okay, next here we get into views on what the image of God is. This is kind of the traditional uh, is it something we are or is it something that we do? I mean, there's, there is what is called the substantive view. And then, you know, if you move on to the next pages, there, there's what's called the relational view and then the, uh, the functional view. So, you know, is the image of God. So I guess what we're dealing here, is it, uh, when we come to image of God, is it, is it structural? And structural would mean more ontological, like who we we are in essence. Or is it relational? Or is it uh, functional? So the the structural view, or the or the substantive view. So this would be pretty synonymous with the substantive is going to emphasize that the image of God is, a stru is, a, is structural to who we are. It's not based on what you do, but it's, it's based on you know, who you are. So, uh, and, and you've gotten to understand, I mean, one of the, oh, I guess I mentioned on number one that, you know, when you, when you get to some cult groups, you know, some will say that the image of God pretty much specifically is, the, is, is a physical image and you know we get we'll get more into that later the obviously god is spirit um i do think there is something about the fact being man made as a physical a material and immaterial being where there is something in that that does reflect god without uh, affirming that god the father has a physical form 
You do get into the issues of the mystery of the incarnation where you eventually do have Jesus who is God take human form. But we wouldn't just say the image of God is just a, phys- just a physical thing. Some have speculated, number two, that the image of God is the ability to walk up- upright more common view is that the image of God is some psychological or spiritual quality in human nature, such as reason. So throughout history, I think reason oftentimes has been pointed to as the structural thing that makes uh, man the image of God. The relational view would be that some think of the image of God as the experience of relationships. Humans this isn't Erickson's view, but as he's defining it, humans can be said to be in the image or display the image of God when standing in a particular relationship, which is indeed the image. Uh, some of the neo-Orthodox theologians in particular were really emphasizing the, uh, that the image of God is most tied to relationships. Particularly, you know, when you're in Genesis 1, 27, when it talks about, you know, he created them, you know, the image of, when you, you have the statement of the image of God, then it talks about he created them male and female, that uh, some will say, you have the reference, reference to the image of God, then it talks about male and female and their relationship, and so it's primarily, primarily that. Um, some might nuance, nuance that a little bit on my point number six. While some see engaging in relationships as the image of God and others hold, uh, others hold that the image of God is the capacity to have a relationship. Thus some hold a relational view while, while acknowledging that one could still possess the image of God without always participating in relationships. I think one, one of the things I think has to be pointed out that if you're going to link image of God almost exclusively with relationship, um, what does that mean that if somebody is not is not relating. Does that mean that they're not image of God? So you can come into various scenarios. Uh, if somebody was really uh, perhaps severely handicapped and didn't appear to be able to relate like others, would that be a denial of that person being in the image of God? Somebody who decides to be a hermit and live in the wilderness for 40 years and not have any contact with a person, would they not be the image of God because they're not relating? Then there's the functional view in with this view because in genesis 126 to 28 there's such a close relationship between being image of god and ruling and subduing the earth some will say that it's function which is the main thing when it comes to the image of god so thus typically the functional view interprets the imago as the human person's exercise of dominion over the created order and lower creatures thus genesis 1 28, and his command to subdue the earth and rule over it, its living things is seen as an explanation of the image of God mentioned in Genesis 127. So now we come to an evaluation. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'll just tell you my view up front. I, I think that there's, I think all of these are related to it. I do think that there is something, I, I mean, if, if you're pushing me on this, I, would, I guess I would hold to a structural substantive view. Man is created image of God, uh, an image bearer. So I think there's something structural to who he is. And then what I would say is because he is structurally image of God, he is able to relate and function in the sense of dominion. So... Um, as I emphasize a substantive or structural view, it's not to the exclusion of these others. Thus, there would be a close relationship between who you are structurally and what you're supposed to do. I I would say, because man is image of God, he is to relate and function as God has tasked him to do, and he's given the ability to do that. Now, what ends up happening with the fall? When the fall occurs... Man is still image of God, but he's marred in all of his being. There's total depravity. Every aspect of his being is marred by sin. And because of that, he's not able to carry out these. I mean, uh, when it comes to relational, I mean, you know, Adam and Eve have a son. What does he do? He kill, you know, he, he ends up killing his younger brother. <laughs> so relational, you're, you're just going to see throughout human history, man killing man and man oppressing man. We see that today, turn on the news. Man likes to kill other 
other human beings. When it comes to function, is man carrying out the uh, rule and subdue mandate faithfully today? No. I mean, he has some victories here and there. We're grateful for technological progress in those things. But man's relationship to creation is still largely uh, chaotic. And of course, man oftentimes abuses the creation, uses uh, its natural resources at times in ways that aren't, aren't the best. So all those things are not, not being done as, as, as they should. So... And I do want to mention here, when it comes to the evaluation of the relational view, the relational view has rightly drawn attention to the importance of relationships in regard to being human. God did not create man as a statue or a trophy. He created man for fellowship with himself. The image of God is also closely linked to the relationship that a husband and wife are to have. Plus, it should be noted that the two great commandments in Scripture are to love God and love others. So we're affirming the importance of relationship, however... As important as relationships are to being human, the ability to engage in relationships is probably a consequence of being a human who is made in the image of God. So I'm going to end up arguing both relationship and function, dominion, are a consequence of image of God. Yep. The structural evolution. um, Is that, my understanding is kind of a physical body that we're talking about? Includes the physical. I wouldn't say it's just limited to that, but it includes it, right? Because then, you know, the, my mind immediately races to things like cremation. Mm-hmm. You know, we typically would say, well, the person is gone, and there's just a body remaining. But if that body is the image of God, are we are we wrong to do that? Um, in regard to cremation itself, or what we say about the body after it's dead, or both? Both. Yeah. Uh, that, that's that, that's a great that's a great application of it. Yeah, um, I would say I think we need to bring good theology even to the. I'm not gonna get into the cremation thing at this. I'm just making a statement about like when a person dies. Um, I don't ever say anymore. This is just a shell. Of course, there's truth to that. I mean, when when a believer dies, or even an unbeliever, but I'm just focused on a believer. When a believer dies, we know their spirit goes to be with the Lord. So when somebody says this is just a shell, I understand what they're saying. It's just like the, the you know the, the 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 real you know my uh my sis my sister who's a believer just died a few weeks ago so we talked about you know this this isn't Sue anymore she's up in you know she's up in heaven but as we say that I think we also need to understand that since we're headed for bodily resurrection and since we're fearfully and wonderfully made it actually is more than a shell because that's that's headed towards resurrection God cares about that body that's rotting in the ground because it's going to be resurrected someday. So in that sense, I think we need to bring good theology even to the funerals when it comes to that, that it is a, uh, I, mean, I made sure, I, I mean, I did the graveside service. I made sure that I communicated that the Christian worldview affirms the goodness of the body. This, this has occurred because we're in a fallen world, but this body is going to be raised from the dead. It is more than a shell. <laughs> and so I don't know if that answers your question there. Um, but, uh, then I think when you get into the, the cremation and you know burial and all that sort of stuff, I mean that's, you know, I might get more more into that later. I don't, I don't, I don't. I mean, I I I, th- I think there's a difference between saying what must be mandated and what are what our preferences. I mean, I, I I I don't think I don't think cremation in of itself is 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 wrong. It's not my preference. If I were to die before the rapture, I would want a burial because I think it emphasizes certain things in regard. To, I'm looking forward to the resurrection of the body in a certain way. So. Uh, but I'm not going to go into a full-blown thing of that. I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, if someone has strong convictions on that and otherwise, I don't try to talk them out of it. But the body is important. That's the main point. All right, any other thoughts? Okay. Um, all right, so main point of, as we're evaluating the relational view would be I think relationship is a consequence of being image of God. You can't just say relationship is the image of God because what if somebody's not relating? You know, we we would not say that that person is not in. You know, we shouldn't say they're not an image of God or that they're not a a, a person. Uh, B the evaluation of the functional view. It's going to be pretty similar here. There's no doubt the image of God is closely tied with function and particularly ruling and subduing the, uh, the world. 
I'll just give you my evaluation here down at C. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to say here, our I'll just start with B here. Our, our evaluation of the functional view is similar to that of the relational. The functional view rightly seizes on an important function of humanity, ruling and subduing. Thus, there's a close connection there. However, the exercise of dominion and the image of God are not the same. As Erickson states, Genesis 1 contains no clear equation of the image of God with the exercise of dominion. On the contrary, there are some indications that they are distinguishable, and thus it's a consequence or application of the image of God, not the image of God itself. So in a nutshell, because we are structurally image of God, which I would say is a combination of our material and immaterial aspects that somehow uh, reflects the image of God. Of course, there's a mystery el element to that. When, when it, whenever you're dealing with uh, a person being material and immaterial in a complex unity, I mean, there, there's a mysterious element to that because, I mean, there's obviously ways in which the image of God is, is closely related to reflecting God. And of course, you have the, uh, the twin truths that, you know, God is spirit, but we're also dealing with the fact that we have the incarnation of the Son of God, who is the perfect image of God. So Jesus can, is it with Philip, where he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So you end up having that dynamic come into play. So I don't know if I can go much more beyond that, but there's, there's something about the complex unity of the material and immaterial aspects of us that are the image of God that allow us to be in the three relationships and function as we should. And thus I would include, you know, when it comes to the image of God being a, being a part of us and being who we are structurally, uh, these are things that I think it would include, perhaps the image of God can be linked to personhood and the powers of personality that make humans like God, allowing humans to interact with you know, God, others, and creation. Perhaps the image of God is linked to the communicable attributes, those qualities of God that have at least a partial counterpart in human beings, love, justice, wisdom, goodness, etc. As Wayne Grudem says, every way in which man is like God is part of his being in the image and likeness of God. There ends up being various ways we reflect the image of God. You know, and this is where, like I said, I think this is pretty interesting, and this is mostly going off of uh, um, some of the concepts that I guess I use uh, Grudem and, and Culver here. But metaphysically, the human person is a living, personal, active being with personality. He's a complex unity of soul slash spirit and body. Uh, to uh, be intellectually, the human person has a rational mind. He is aware of himself, others, his environment, and God. He possesses intellectual abilities such as critical and logical thinking, memory, imagination, creativity, and language for communicating thoughts. So I think all those things are, all those things are related. Uh, we make a big deal out of that in apologetics, that uh, you know, as we start discussing the transcendental argument for God's existence, that just even the, the, uh, the very ability to reason itself can only exist if the God of the Bible exists. He is a God of rationality and of order. You know, um, you know we see, you know, in the beginning was, was the word, the logos, the communication aspect of that. Um, the only reason anybody can reason at all is because the God of the Bible exists. Volitionally, you know, the uh, issue of uh, having a will, being able to choose, being accountable for one's actions, Emotionally, the human person experiences a wide range of emotions, such as joy, fear, jealousy, anxiety, anger, guilt, and shame. As I mentioned, Grudem does a good job of talking about complexity of emotion, which humans have that's different from animals and others. Morally, you know, from Romans 2, 14 to 15, even those that don't have the Mosaic law, uh, everybody has the law of God written in their heart. Morality comes from God. Relationally, People are able to have the capacity to engage in relationships with others, functionally, you know, being able to you know, exercise dominion over the earth. So, so in other words, I mean, the image of God ends up being very, very holistic, very relational, very functional, very uh, metaphysical, emotional. I mean, there's really no aspects of our being that aren't uh, affected by that. And of course, when you go through these areas, you know, you see uh, 
you see a, a relationship with Jesus. I mean, even metaphysically who we are as human, Jesus, the, uh, the word became flesh and tabernacled or dwelt among us. So when Jesus had flesh like we do, of course, there ends up being a resurrected Jesus, right? So 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that he's the first fruits of the resurrection. So not only did Jesus come like us and looking like us structurally, his resurrection body is a prototype and the first fruits of what our resurrected bodies will be like. When it comes to intellectually, obviously Jesus is using his intellect and his reasoning as it should be for the glory of God. Volitionally, you see you know, him making the right choices. Emotionally, we, you know, we see that Jesus has uh, all the emotions of being human, including anger and sadness and those sorts of things. Morally, obviously he's always making the right decisions for the glory of God. He's relational. He evidences the right relationship over these three areas. Probably the first two are most evidence, loving God and loving others. But remember, whenever he does a nature miracle, that's a sample of the millennial kingdom on a, on a, on a, uh, on a smaller scale. It's a sample of what it will be like. So he's showing his dominion over nature. And then obviously relationship function, all those are. So you can just point those back to uh, Jesus and see, again, he ends up becoming the perfect example of what the image of God is supposed to look like. All right, any other questions at this point? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have one uh, really concerning Jesus' uh, resurrected body. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the structural sense of Jesus' yeah. body changes. And he's able still to eat fish, but also to appear in rooms that aren't there and mm -hmm. on the road to, I mean, that are closed. And on yeah. the road to Emmaus, he's able to leave. Yeah. Um, 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 my question concerns really how does the structural relate to the functional and is there a dependence on the two and then how does that relate to how believers in their resurrected body will yeah. uh, structurally and functionally resemble the image of God? Yeah. I'll try to take parts of that. I think, I, I think there is a relationship. I mean, I guess what I would say, my broad statement would be is I think there will be something about the the resurrected body and what that includes that will allow us to maximally function as we should, which probably is going to include probably just even the way our brains functioning at the capacity that they're supposed to be. So so everything, I guess, spiritually, uh, intellectually, physically. And so in other words, I I I would I would gather that. Uh, Man, man's man's ability, his his creative abilities, and his command of the various aspects of nature are going to be such where you will see a much accelerated ability to to rule and subdue and technological advances and all that sort of thing. I would say that that there is there is the X factor of the fact that Jesus is the God Man. So there's when 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 you when you get it, obviously there's a uniqueness. I mean, Jesus is the first roots, but he's also the God man. So when it comes to aspects of the essence of deity that he draws upon, I mean, could there be disconnect? I mean, I, I don't think would, anybody would claim that we're going to be, you know, exa exactly ontologically in every way like Jesus because he, he has guests. So in that sense, there could be some differences. But I, I think it's still, I think you had a couple other little nuances in there that I may have. Yeah, Go ahead. Uh, you hit on it largely. Uh, really just... The, are, are these three different aspects dependent on each other? So in other words, like, um, I would say yes. So, so I mean, they're our, intricately our related. Our structure as a re resurrected body, in a sense, changes, thereby allowing us for our function to change and yeah. to be, be manifested in, in all three of yeah. these at the yeah. same time, yeah. Because I mean, there's there's something about the I mean obviously there's the mystery element of that we're 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 a new creature with a new heart but we still have the flesh and there there's there's still something I mean the flesh is a is obviously a sin principle within us but there's also a sense in which our even our bodies which are conditioned to sin kind of even influence even though we're new creatures in Christ can still have us towards sinful tendencies at times so obviously that will be removed um, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? The 
I guess what we'll do, you know, we got a, maybe a couple more minutes for a break. Maybe what I'll mention here is, yeah, uh, some of the, I mean, j I guess some of the implications, I'm not going into a full-blown discussion of cultural issues at this particular point, but you know, uh, having a proper understanding of the image of God is going to impact how we view things. I mean, you know, you have the, you know, the controversy, you know, with, with secular humanism and evolution, you know, evolution has claimed that human beings are highly developed and intelligent animals, you know, but our, our understanding of uh, who we are as image of God indicates that man is created with the dignity and in his original state and eventually restored state higher than the rest of the created order. So therefore, I mean, there, there is a, there is an important distinction between human beings and animals. We're not just a highly developed animal. So um, any, any, any sorts of uh, philosophies that would just try to equal out human beings with nature in general or environmentalism or animals where there becomes not much of a difference, that obviously would be not accepted by the, uh, the Christian worldview. Um, again, too, when it comes to you know, animal rights movement that, you know, there's some forms of that that try to make animals basically on a par with human beings. Same with the environment. Now, I do want to make a caveat there. I mean, the thing is, men are different than the animals. They're different than the environment. Um, I do not think that God created man to abuse these realms. So as I talk about man as being superior over the animal kingdom and the environment, that doesn't mean a willy-nilly uh, do whatever you want. It doesn't matter sort of thing. I mean, we're, we're, we're created to be responsible stewards. And so man's relationship to those things uh, does matter. Now, like I do say, I do think that the full exercise of that is going to be primarily in the, in the kingdom to come. But I think it should change a, per, a, a Christian's outlook. I mean, if they understand that the, originally God created man to rule and subdue the earth and that those things really matter, I mean, that should impact how we interact uh, with our environment and have a respect for that without going off the other side of the log and making that the only thing that we're concerned about or making it such where there's not much of a distinction between people and those things. Uh, capital punishment, you do see the uh, sanctioning of that uh, in Genesis 9-6. Revelation 13, government has the right of the sword. I mean, you do see that uh, uh, the fact, and I understand there's going to be differences in how governments treat that issue or whatever, but God's taking the image of God very seriously, even to the point of, uh, of uh, a retribution for a life taken. I think it's going to have implications for the abortion issue. The, uh, you know, we would view the, that there's scripture, we're, we're not getting into this particular issue at this point, but all those who would be conceived would be considered human. We don't, we, as Christians, we don't make distinctions between being biologically human and being a person which is what our culture likes to do now. Part of the reason why you can have uh, abortion and uh, advocates of certain kinds of uh, active euthanasia and those sorts of things is because people are starting to make a distinction between being biologically human and uh, being a human person. Um, we would say that they're intricately related to each other. Also too, image of God is going to have implications for other things. There's no room for racism when we understand uh, the, uh, that everyone's made in the image of God, particularly when you read the nations and you know, Genesis 10 to 11, all of that is important to God. So a proper understanding of the image of God should lead to proper human relationships. Um, Grudem said, just kind of a summary statement here, the image of God has profound implications for our conduct toward others. It means that people of every race deserve equal dignity and rights. It means that elderly people, those seriously ill, the mentally retarded, and children yet unborn deserve full protection and honor as human beings. If we ever deny our unique status and creation as God's only image bearers, we will soon begin to depreciate the value of human life. We'll tend to see humans as merely a higher form of animal and will begin to treat others as such. We will also lose much of our sense of meaning in life. So... The image of God, doctrine of man, anthropology has major implications, even for a lot of the cultural issues that we face. Yes. 
about the, the, the structure or structure of you uh, related I mean, in practical way to version. Um, well, when unborn baby are in the womb, mm -hmm. they don't have that the kind of structural physicality that you know. So how that relates to uh, well, I would say is the uh, the very fact of being I mean now even science no I mean as soon as there's conception there's biologically human and it may not be as fully developed but it is human so I, I would say the structural is there even though that will grow and so and we're obviously affirming that that being biology is important and it matter and it matters and there, therefore when there's biologically human there's human person there's image of God so we may what to, we, we may go to the DNA as a final mind structure of the, our uh, structure, you know. Yeah. I would probably just, I'm not much of a scientist. I mean, I would just uh, I would just link personhood with conception and go to the Bible passages, which are referring to the unborn and treating them as persons. So obviously, like when you I mean, when you get into the abortion issue, what, what's the one thing that the United States Supreme Court stated in the. Uh, you know, in the early 70s is that you could be biologically human but not a person. Personhood doesn't take place until until uh, birth. But we, we would say that's a distinction. Um, Christian worldview says you're biologically human, you're image of God, you're, you're a creation of God, you're a person. We don't make distinctions. Um, one, of, one of the things that's also being pushed too is our society as it becomes more secular is emphasizing functionality as being inherently related to being human. So thus, if you're not functioning, you're not person, you can, you can be gone. And obviously, you, could see that you can see how that would play out with both uh, the unborn and severely handicapped or elderly, where you deem them not valuable to society, not functioning as they should, so therefore not a person and therefore can be discarded. So that's where I think the Christian worldview is gonna help protect the unborn and the handicapped and the elderly by emphasizing that they they always were they from beginning to end are persons because structurally they're human, and that like I said that can be one one of the day if you do go strictly to a relational or functional view, you can start declaring biologically human people not to be persons and therefore can be discarded. Uh, I mean there's more of a there there's more of a I mean the uh, I mean not only uh, do we have abortions and not partial birth abortions. There are some who are calling for people not to be even deemed a person until age one or two or some other, some sort of function, other things where they will develop to be functional. I mean, there, there are people that, that they, they don't even want, they, they want the option to take you out to even be there to, until you're, you know, one or two years old. We're going to continue with our look at the image of God. I want to draw your attention to some summary statements about the image of God on pages 19 to 21. And then we may look at some of the quotes Hokama has in his book, Created in God's Image. So what I have here is uh, the image of God in summary. To start out, if we're going to summarize the image of God, we're going to say that man in the image of God means that man is like God and in some ways represents God. I've also added here, and I'll make sure I add this to the new set of notes when I teach this again, but I also think it has implications for being a son and a king, which has to do with relationship and ruling. So man is creating the image of God as a, you know, as a son and a king to relate and to rule. Next, the Bible does not explicitly state the ways in which man is like God, but the more we know about God and man from Scripture, the more that we can know about the image of God in man. Of course, the best way for us to understand the image of God is to look at Jesus, who is the perfect image of God. Jesus perfectly evidences the image of God you know, in three primary relationships. God, human beings, and creation. And then I would say that love is at the center of these relationships. As we pursue the proper relationship to God and others, now we increasingly become conformed to the image of Christ, who himself is the perfect image of God. 
So there is that already aspect. We have been, you know, we've been made a new creature in Christ. We have the uh, spiritual blessings of the new covenant in our lives now, including a new heart. We have uh, positional, you know, these are things we'll get into later. We're positionally sanctified. We're to progressively show sanctification and godliness in our lives. So there is an already, you know, it comes to the theology of the image of God. There, there is an already aspect of how that should look. We should be conformed to the image of Christ. In the eschaton, in the future, when the earth is restored, the people of God will again be in a positive relationship to the creation. While attention to Jesus is primary for understanding the image of God, we can understand the image also as we know more about God himself, particularly the communicable attributes of God. Those attributes of God that man also has, although imperfectly, such as wisdom, knowledge, love, grace, mercy, etc., the image of God can also be understood more clearly as we study the ways in which man is different from all other creatures, such as self-consciousness, complexity of emotion, etc. The image of God involves both structural and functional aspects. In our structure as human beings, we possess the image of God. The structural capacity should lead to proper functioning in the realms of relationships and ruling and subduing the creation. How the image of God relates to the four parts of the Christian story. First, with creation. Man, including the male and female, are created in the image of God. Like his creator, man evidences both unity and diversity. Both the male and female can be called man, yet the male and female are distinct and have differing roles. Man is in a proper relationship with God, humans, and creation at this particular time. Then you have the fall. So what does that mean for the image of God? Both man or man, both Adam and Eve violate the creator creature distinction by acting autonomously and rebelling against God's command. The image of God is not lost, but becomes marred. Man's threefold relationship suffers. So if you read Genesis three, you know, we haven't gotten to the sin aspect of the class, but Genesis three will show how all three are negatively affected. In regard to man and to God, man is spiritually dead. Two, in regard to humans, tension is placed between the man and the woman. And you get into a little debate over the, you know, your desire shall be for him and he shall rule over you. Again, some take that as uh, the indication of still the desire for physical intimacy, even in spite of the, the, the child, the pain of childbirth. Others think it indicates more of a negative tension between the man and the woman. Uh, which I personally think is the case. Even if it's not that, we do know there's tension. We also know that when the children are born, Cain is going to slay Abel. So there's definitely tension in the human relationships. And then number three, in regard to creation, the earth now works against man and frustrates him as he works to provide. So, you know, there's going to be thorns and thistles and working against man from that point onward. He's also going to return to dust from where he came. When it comes to the incarnation or Jesus, Jesus is the, uh, you know, it, it, let me just say something here. As I, as I update my notes, I probably, remember at the beginning of class, I told you that I, I actually have, I talk about five parts of the story now, which would be, uh, I include promise. I like to put a uh, promise after the fall, but before the arrival of Christ. So I guess what I would do with that now is I would, you know, I, I, I would put promise in here and emphasize, now you, there's probably a little bit of canonical theology here as I'm doing this, is uh, we, you do know from Genesis 3.15 that there's going to be a, 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 a person from the woman, a, a seed of the woman who's going to come and defeat the power behind the serpent and restore the creation. You know, later we're going to know that that is Jesus the God-man who is the perfect image of God. So I, I would include the fact, I mean, at Genesis 3.15, there's just the promise, hey, there's some man who's going to come down the road who's going to win <laughs> and restore everything. But uh, if, if you make connections of, uh, you know, Jesus to Adam, image of God with Adam, Jesus is perfect image. I think there's, to add promise in there, I think is legitimate. All right, so when you come to three now, the incarnation of Christ, Jesus is the God-man who is also the perfect image of God. 
those who belong to Jesus are saved and can evidence the image of God as God intends, although imperfectly. Sanctification is the process by which Christians become renewed in the image of God. So have you ever thought of that before? I mean, I'm sure most of you have thought of the doctrine of sanctification, you know, growing in godliness. But have you ever thought of it in terms of sanctification is also the process by which you're manifesting the image of God as it's supposed to, as it's supposed to look. So keep a close connection between sanctification and the image of God. The Christian is now in a proper relationship with God, although he does not always serve him as he should. The Christian can also love his fellow man, although he does not always do as he should. The Christian can bring his worldview to all aspects of his environment, but the creation is still under the curse and will not be restored until Jesus comes again. And then number four, with the restoration, uh, Christians are glorified and perfectly evidence the image of God in their lives. Christians are in total harmony with the three relationships, God, humans, and creation. So in a nutshell, when you get to the the eschaton, the millennial kingdom, and then uh, into the eternal state, man's functioning within all three of these as he should. He was supposed to be doing it at creation, but failed, but he'll be doing that. Thus, I would say, I mean, this is a little bit broader than the image of God, but when I think about like what, 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 what is, when you think of the Bible's storyline and you think of its theme, I would, I would say, if, 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 you're trying, if I'm trying to like find a, a pithy, small way to say the theme of the Bible, I would call it, the theme of the Bible is kingdom, within the context of relationships. So when I, when, 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 when I look at creation, I see kingdom prints all over it because there's image of God and all that is God's king, man is small k king, he's supposed to rule and subdue. So there's kingdom there. You get to Genesis 22, five, his servants are reigning. So you have that kingdom terminology right there. But when you think about the relationships, God, other human beings in creation, so it's very, very relational. So I guess as I'm thinking about it, I would see kingdom within the context of thriving relationships with love being the essence of that. That's really what the Bible's all about. Genesis 3 through Revelation 20 is the process by which the promise plan and Jesus is the ultimate man makes that happen. And then those who identify with him also participate in that. So when you get to the Genesis 1 and 2, once upon a time, Revelation 21 and 22, they lived happily ever after, kingdom restored, relationships, everything's thriving. Remember also creativity, because Revelation 21 and 22 talks about the nations bringing their glory into the new Jerusalem. So even the people groups and those spread out about the earth are using their creativity for the glory of God, bringing it to the new Jerusalem. So it's very... uh, a lot of unity, a lot of diversity. Um, so kingdom and relationships, that's what I would say. Yep. Uh, I believe there's uh, an uh, image of God in some capacity. Mm-hmm. And uh, for believers, the restoration is uh, going back to a uh, perfect relationship with God, with people, and creation. Yeah. For unbelievers, that was it's the other wrong. opposite way. Yeah, it's completely lost. So in that case, the image is completely lost. That's a great topic because he's bringing up the issue of the unbeliever now and in the eschaton. That's a really interesting topic. It's a very um, awesome, in a scary sense, topic because if you think of everything that's true for the and I don't have all the answers for the escha- for what that what the image means for the unbeliever. But if you think about it, if if being a believer in this age is the process by which we're evidencing the image of God more and more as we should, and then with glorification we get that, what does that mean on the other end? Because clearly, in other words, some, some have postulated that the unbeliever's eternal destiny, that they're almost at the point where they're not even human anymore. So whether that is the, I mean, whether you would say they're not, whether they are or not, the, the definitely they're far, far removed from what humanity was supposed to be. And so that's a real interesting thing to think about. Because obviously in, the, in their eternal destiny, they're not loving God, others, or I mean, they're totally removed from everything that they were created to be. 
the wrath of God in its full form upon them. So if it's not the removal of humanity, it's very, very close. Obviously, they're paying the consequences for being human and thus having volitional choices of which there's accountability. So clearly that there's a connection there, but there is far removed from what being a human is supposed to be as possible. That's a very, uh, that's a very, uh, like I said, scary, awesome thought. Yep. Is the perfect image of God is what allows uh, Christians to not sin anymore? When, when we have Jesus Christ and you know in the yeah. future and, and all that, is that is that what makes us? If we have our image of God completed in us, yeah. is that what makes us perfect? Yeah, I think that's related. I mean, I I would tie it to all the members of the Trinity, but that also would include the New Covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit. So yes, so the glorification is a part of that, but even that there's the uh, inner working of the new covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit that guarantees that. So even as that's occurring, it's still God. I mean, even in the eternal state, it's still the Holy Spirit in that regard. Yeah. I wonder, with Adam and Eve, did they have the perfect image of God right in the beginning before it was marred? Well, when we per- I mean, if perfect includes the sense that, it, that there can't be a fall or whatever, I mean, no, I mean, there's, there's, still, there's still that, the, the test of the Genesis 2, 15 to 17. I mean, I do think that there is something, in other words, the restoration of all things in the eternal state is greater than the original Garden of Eden. So I, I, like I said, is there eschatology in Genesis 1 and 2? I think so, not in the sense of man has to earn his salvation and then he gets the eternal state, but he does have to fulfill the, 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 uh, the, the, cre- the kingdom mandate of Genesis 1, 26 to 28. I think with the eternal state as a reward. So, uh, yeah. Do you want to follow up on that at all? or Okay. Good. Um, okay, any other questions? All right. Now, then I also have one more chart here. This is a little bit different. The, the, the other chart I just showed you was the image of God relating to the four parts of, the, of uh, Christian history. Uh, this is dealing with stages of the image of God. We could say uh, there's the original image, man in proper relationship with God, humans, and creation. Then there's a corrupted image, which is man's relationship with God, humans, and creation is tarnished. Then there's perfect image. Jesus embodies perfectly the image of God and is in proper relationship with God, man, and creation. Four, Although still imperfect, this is the renewed image, man is in right relationship with God, has the ability to love fellow man, and will be in a proper relationship with creation later. And then five, the perfected image, which is the restoration of glorification. Man is in perfect relationship with God, man, and creation. All right, at this point, let's go ahead and look at some uh, comments from... Hokemas. Remember, you had to. Hopefully, you're getting a chance to read the first uh, six chapters, which deal with the doctrine of man. I'm going to start in chapter two. I do think he has an interesting chapter here when he's talking about man as a created person. Uh, I think this concept of man as a creature and a person is very helpful. And I think it actually helps with the tensions between uh, man's volition and accountability and the sovereignty of God because he touches on both. He says on the, on the ba- this is page five, on the, uh, one of the basic presuppositions of the Christian view of man is belief in God as the creator, which leads to the view that the human person does not exist autonomously or independently, but as a creature of God. Next paragraph, an obvious implication of the fact of creation is that all created reality is completely dependent on God. So that's indicating man as creature, his total total existence relies upon God, he owes God everything. But then he also brings up the issue, man is not only a creature, however, he is also a person. And to be a person means to have a kind of independence, not absolute, but relative. To be a person means to be able to make decisions, to set goals and to move in the direction of those goals. 
It means to possess freedom, at least in the sense of being able to make one's own choices. The human being is not a robot whose course is totally determined by forces outside of him. He has the power of self-determination and self-direction. Again, just remember, I mean, Hokema is a strong Calvinist guy. And he'll even come back at the end where he'll have kind of some, some words for uh, fellow uh, Calvinists when, when he comes to discussing these issues. So we're not, we're not talking about an Armenian guy here when he's talking about choices, but he's talking about a, ki- a, a kind of independence. Uh, the fact that man is a person to such an extent that he's accountable for his choices. When, when you get to the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20, 11 to 15, people are held accountable for the, the deeds that they've committed. So there's... And of course, there's going to be a distinction between Adam's ability to choose and then those who are depraved as a result of the fall. But he does say here that in some, the human being is both a creature and a person. He or she is a created person. This now is the central mystery of man. How can man be both a creature and a person at the same time? To be a creature, as we have seen, means absolute dependence on God. To be a person means relative independence. To be a creature means that I cannot move a finger or utter a word apart from God. To be a person means that when my fingers are moved, I move them, and that when words are uttered by my lips, I utter them. To be creatures means that God is the potter and we are the clay. To be persons means that we are the ones who fashion our lives by our decisions. So he calls this the central mystery of man. Because to us, it seems deeply mysterious that man can be both a creature and a person at the same time. Next paragraph. Though we cannot rationally comprehend how it is possible for the human being to be a creature and a person at the same time, clearly this is what we must think. And I like what he says here. Denial of either side of this paradox will fail to do justice to the biblical picture. So what he's saying here is if you end up emphasizing one without the other, you're going to be out of balance. The Bible teaches that both man's creatureliness, teaches both man's creatureliness and man's personhood. If you look at the next paragraph, our theological understanding of man must therefore keep both of these truths clearly in focus. All secular anthropologies fail to take into account human creatureliness and therefore give a distorted view of man. Any view of the human being that fails to see him or her as centrally related to, totally dependent on, and primarily responsible to God falls short of the truth. So, and that's true. I mean, you, I mean, you just see that on a cultural level. I mean, whenever there's any kind of social issue debated, abortion, euthanasia, whatever's going on, uh, you, I'm talking at the, when you see it in the media and all that stuff, you usually don't see discussions of what it means that we're creatures in the image of God, right? The discussion just goes basically towards man's autonomy and what man thinks. But for us who are Christians, I mean, we, we have to base our anthropology and what it means for social cultural issues based on our theology, right? Of a biblical anthropology and a biblical view of God. On the other hand, all deterministic anthropologies, which treat humans as if they were puppets or robots, perhaps with God pulling the strings or pushing the buttons, fails to do justice to human personhood. So basically what he's calling there for is to uh, take both, both into account. And then he'll point out other areas where you, where you see a human and a divine side. Um, you know, when you get into the issues of regeneration and conversion, I mean, we'll get into that later. I mean, God is the one who causes spiritual life. He's the one who causes those who are dead to be alive. And yet there is that side of conversion and repentance where a person is to you know, repent and believe the gospel. And you see those very, very closely related. When it comes to sanctification, Work out your salvation, for it is God who is at work in you. I mean, you know, work out your salvation, work out something you have, but it is God who is in you. So the fact that he points to other areas where there's that, yeah, the, the uh, God's sovereignty and human responsibility, I think is important. He closes this chapter on page 10 by saying, enough has been said to show that the understanding of man as a created person is important and relevant. Theologians like myself who stand in the Reformed or Calvinistic tradition have commonly emphasized the creaturely aspect of man, his total dependence on God, and therefore the ultimate sovereignty of God in every area of life, particularly in the work of saving his people from their sins. Arminian theologians, on the other hand, usually lay all the stress on man's personhood 
Hence, when they speak of the process of salvation, they will emphasize the importance of man's voluntary decision and continuing faithfulness to God. Keeping in mind the paradox that man is both creature and a person will help us do full justice to both the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. Those of us who stand in the Reformed tradition must not neglect or deny the responsibility of man. Those who stand in the Arminian tradition should not neglect or deny the ultimate sovereignty of God. So, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that, but I, 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 I like the paradigm there. Man is the, is the, uh, create, the creature and person or created person for you as you think through uh, having both of those in mind. Okay, chapter three. I really like chapter three and chapter five too. Um, the in-between chapter gets into the history, which I think is helpful as well. Um, if you have anything you want to mention in here, feel free to. I, I might just draw your attention to, I really like the very bottom of 20, the very bottom of page 20 through page 25, because I, I think he does, this is where he does that really good job of linking Jesus with the image of God and what that means for us. So if you look at the very end of uh, page 20, uh, God made man in his image. That is clear from both the Old and New Testaments, but the Bible also teaches that Jesus Christ is the perfect man, the unsurpassed example of what God wants us to be like. It is therefore exciting to see in the New Testament, Christ is called the perfect image of God. You know, then he quotes 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, and then ends up saying, God's glory, in other words, is revealed in the face of Christ. When we see Christ, we see the glory of God. To the same effect, Colossians 1.15 which we also looked at. So although God is invisible in Christ, the invisible God becomes visible. One who looks at Christ is actually looking at God. You know, he tells Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Hebrews 1.3, that was one where we, we didn't quote earlier. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Okuma goes on to say that every trait, every characteristic, every quality found in the Father is also found in the Son, who is the Father's exact representation. If you look on page 22, since Christ was totally without sin, in Christ we see the image of God in its perfection. As a skillful teacher, Jesus uses visual aids to help his or her pupils understand what is being taught. So God the Father has given us in Jesus Christ a visual example of what the image of God is. There is no better way of seeing the image of God than to look at Jesus Christ. What we see and hear in Christ is what God intended for man. If this is so, then the best way to learn what the image of God is is not to contrast man with animals as often been done and then find the divine image in those qualities you know, that differ. Rather, we must learn to know what the image of God is by looking at Jesus Christ. <clears throat> what must therefore be at the center of the image of God is not characteristics like ability to reason or ability to make decision, important as they are, but rather that which was central in the life of Christ, love for God and love for man. If it is true that Christ perfectly images God, then the heart of the image of God must be love, for no man ever loved as Christ loved. <clears throat> so I was trying to communicate that point earlier when we were talking about lo uh, love being at the essence of relationship and what the image is supposed to look like. Yep. Now, going back to the threefold uh, yeah. um, aspect of being created in the image of God, in relation to God, to human beings in creation. Jesus was, is the perfect uh, image of God while he was walking on earth before uh, right. he raised. So, but he was still living in a corrupted world. So right. how that affects the <coughs> perfect relationship that Jesus may have with the corrupted world. You know what I mean? Yeah. Are you talking mostly, when you say the word, are you referring even to humans or just the, just the created order? No, 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 like when he was walking on earth, yeah. he was perfect, yeah. he didn't sin, but he was relating to a corrupt world. Right. So how that can, can affect that relationship. Yeah, because obviously he faces hostility, because he's still dealing in the realm where S Satan is the prince of the power of the air and the god of this world, and those who are his children fight the light. Right. How this relationship can be perfect. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. Well, I guess what I would say is it can it can still be perfect in the sense that he he 
he he's because obviously he he's not impacted by sin and he is who he is there's nothing that can stop him from loving God and others as he should now he's going to face hostility in a way that we won't when we're in when the kingdom of God is established so I guess the thing that's different is the hostility faced while doing those things obviously that adds a, a, a different and then also obviously also gives him the ability to uh to love those who are hostile to him and pray for those who are crucifying him i mean so there's that involved i mean there, there's also a sense in which the uh the love of god is able to manifest itself even in ways towards enemies and that sort of thing so yeah but the, there is that dynamic of the fallen world that's right yes Page 21 there, he says at the end of that first paragraph, God's glory and honor is revealed in the face of Christ. When we see Christ, we see the glory of God. Does that, if we roll that forward, does that mean that God's glory, when we are glorified, is the fullness of the image of God in us? So say it one more time. So is he connecting there man's glorification with the fullness of the image in the eschaton? Yeah. Yeah, in other words, the glory of God being linked with 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 glorified man, um, I think there's a relate. That's not. I wouldn't call that the totality of the glory of God, but but it being being re, being related to that. Yeah. No more the yeah. Glorification of man. Yeah. Is what I was thinking. Rather than the glory of God. I mean, the fullness yeah. of God is far greater than yeah. the last man. But the glory. We talk about you know when we're glorified. Yeah. I mean, what this sort of suggests is that when we're glorified, that means that image is complete. Right. Right. Yeah, and I think that's right, and that gives glory to God. Yeah, if I'm understanding you right, I'd, I'd agree with that. Good. Okay. Yeah, that's just, it's just a good, it's a really good chapter. Uh, so hopefully you get a chance to look at that. Maybe make a few comments about chapter 5. The, the chapter 5, starting on page 66, is the image of God, a theological summary You know, he gets, you know, he, he makes some statements on page 68 and following where there's a close relationship between man being structurally the image of God and then that manifesting in relationships and ruling and subduing. May, I'm going to page 73. On page 73, Hokuma makes the statement that after the resurrection of the body on the new earth, redeemed humanity will once again be able to image God perfectly. The image of God in man must therefore be seen as involving both the structure of man, his gifts, capacities, and endowments, and the functioning of man, his actions, his relationships, and the way he uses the gifts. God has created us in his image so that we may carry out a task, fulfill a mission, pursue a calling. To enable us to perform the task, God has endowed us with many gifts, gifts that reflect something of, of his greatness and glory. To see man as the image of God is to see both the task and the gifts. But the task is primary. The gifts are secondary. The gifts are the, me are the means for fulfilling the task. And then he talks more again about Christ as the true image of God. And, and, and notice what he does here. This is where he's, he's, he talks about the threefold relationship. And, he, and he's using Christ as the example here. But Christ is an example of a life wholly directed toward God. Next, second, wholly directed toward neighbor. And then third, Christ rules over nature. Page 75, um, this is where he goes more specifically into man and his threefold relationship. And then, you know, he, then he goes, you know, talks about a lot what we've talked about before. The, uh, you know, he brings up what's called the cultural mandate in regard to Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Um, I told you I don't have any problem with the cultural mandate. You know, traditionally re reformed theology is, Emphasize Genesis 1, 26 to 28 as the cultural mandate. I, I like to call it more of a kingdom mandate, which involves culture. But I think that's, that's right. It does involve the earth. He does say on the top of page 81, in point of fact, however, God has placed man into all three of these relationships. Each one is as, is as important and as indispensable as the other two. We can neither exist nor function properly without any of them. Further, they are interrelated. Man is inescapably related to God. This is indeed the prior and most important relationship, which I'm glad he said that. I think that qualifies a little bit about their 
about their being as important as each other. I, I think it's the, the vertical relationship is the foundation for the other two. So anyway, I thought that was, this is just a good page. 81, I think is a good page. He goes into a discussion of that. Um, I won't go into a whole lot of it. He, 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 one thing you will notice when you're reading, I think particularly <clears throat> when you get to page 95, he, as an amillennial, you know, we'd be premillennial at the school. As an amillennialist, I think he sees a little more direct fulfillment of the creation mandate in this age, perhaps than a, pre, than a premillennialist would. Um, I think the picture the scripture is giving is that we're headed towards uh, the day of the Lord and the destruction that is coming with that. And as the millennial kingdom comes and you have a full restoration of nature at that point, um, I do think man today can obviously use his gifts, talents, and abilities as he interacts with his environment. So that is important. But uh, he probably would see a little bit more already on the creation probably than a, pre, than a premillennialist would. But I think one thing to emphasize here is the... If you do hold a premillennial view that you have with the emphasis on the millennial kingdom being the ruling and the restoration of nature, that still is very holistic because it is an understanding that the creation, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the, the, the creation of Genesis 1-2, to two, the restored earth, the restored heavens and earth. So it ends up being uh, very, very holistic. All right. We got a couple minutes left. You guys have any questions or anything you want to talk about? Yep. I have a question concerning the um, relationship to creation. Okay. So <clears throat> our relationship is to be, we need to rule and to serve and preserve. And you said it's it's not yet. <laughs> Don't we have an, a, a rulership over animals or uh, can preserve partly? Yeah. Preserve? I do think that there are implications for this age. In other words, I do think I do think man, particularly believing man, to the best of his ability, should be very responsible and care for it. Because it is, I mean, Genesis 1 and 2 shows us that it is important. I guess the way that I view it is, I mean, as, as a Christian, I want to bring my Christian worldview to every aspect of my environment, which includes the social, cultural, all, all those sorts of things. So I do want to be understanding those things are important to God and they're going to be restored. I think that should impact how I view those, how I view the animals, how I view the environment. And all those sorts of things. So I, but I think there's a difference between saying that and viewing the church's mandate as cultural renewal before the return of Christ. I think I think the primary role of the church is to take the gospel to the ends of the world, calling on people to flee the wrath to come and embrace Christ, and to be ready for His kingdom when it's established. So. Um, I would hope that Christians would take their worldview and apply it to these areas and have a concern for the things that God are concerned, but understand that that's not the church's primary mission in this age. So I think there's a balance. I mean, I can, I'm just speaking existentially, but I can say as I've, as I've thought through the relationship of man to the created order and what it'll be like when Jesus comes again, it does make me more attuned and appreciative of the creation and the animal kingdom. And it makes me, as I live my life, want to be more appreciative and positive in those areas. Again, all the while understanding what the church's primary mission is. Yep. Just as you mentioned how with Jesus Christ was clear about his emphasis on God and human, yeah. human beings, I'm thinking about the epistles as well. I think we do see a very clear um, emphasis upon our relationship with God as well as our relationship upon other human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, are there portions of the epistles or the rest of the New Testament where you say would speak towards our responsibility with, with the creation? Yeah. Well, I think the Hebrews 2, 5 to 8, man still has the right, it quotes Psalm 8, and then it says, but at the, the end says, but, it, but as yet we don't see these things subjected to him. In other words, like it's still there, that mandate's still there, but we don't see it. And that's where you need Christ, the ultimate man, to reign over the earth for it to occur. And it seems like the emphasis is on, on the epistle is we're looking for our savior from heaven who's going to deliver us from the wrath to come. So there's this, the New Testament eschatology, Matthew 24 and 25, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2, it's all, we're headed towards a culmination of a day of the Lord, which is going to 
when that occurs, then it's going to open the door for the, the, millennium, the kingdom that will come the millennium. So I think it does teach that balance. Okay, may have time for one more short one. I have to be done in a minute, but let's go ahead. It has to do with kind of the environmentalist anthropology yeah. or evolution anthropology. What would you say to someone who takes Genesis 1, 129, where every green plant is given to man for food, yeah. um, and they would make that the totality of kind of what it means to be made in the image of God, that he should be vegan or vegetarian or whatever you want to call that, and then kind of says yeah. that's our original intention so that should that's be, how it should be today that's how it should yeah. be or at least as a believer yeah. if you're restored yeah. that should be your intention as well. well i guess what i would just say is we have to live in the times we are i mean when you get the no way at covenant and you i mean as god moves on he's going to sanction the eating of animals and that's going to continue even on with statements in the new testament declaring all foods clean and so I guess the answer to that is you have to be comprehensive in your view of things. You can't just pick out this one verse and say, okay, this is all of it. Because later canonical progressive revelation is going to tell you that in this age we live in that, that that can take place today. Now, when you get into the eternal state, whether there's animal death or that, I mean, that's, that's a whole other issue to talk about. But there's no doubt that for this present age that we live in, it's sanctioned by scripture. So I'd say they're just, they're too limiting and not bringing in other pieces of the puzzle that need to be considered.